depths of the St. James Way and has just been growing and growing. And he's one of the great reasons of how we have so many pilgrims coming through every day. His name is Abel, sorry. Um, so this was the day that when we had 10 beds, we reached maximum capacity and so we all had dinner together. It was very exciting. Um, and this is hopefully what we want to see every single day. 10 or 20 or more people come through and just learn and sit with us and eat with us. And as well as that, as I mentioned, we have the activities that are usually monthly. And so we try to um, speak about Jesus and eat together and just be a community together. As well, we have teams that we bring over from the States. Um, we're hoping to bring a team from here next year. That'll be exciting. I'm looking forward to that. Um, and so they'll walk with us. And it's a great experience because they get to grow in Christ as they walk it. At the same time, they get to share with others as they go on the, the St. James Way. We usually ask them to invite a few people that they've met while they're walking to come and eat dinner with us. And then after dinner, we have a discussion. And it's amazing the results we've had through that of just people joining us for dinner and staying um, in countries like Portugal and Spain where people are not very religious and have a little bit of a bad attitude towards that. For them to be open to eat with us and then just stay of their own accord, it's pretty amazing. And we've had just people wanting to sit and ask questions and even be argumentative, but in a positive way. And so we've seen great results for that. Um, and so people just walk along and they can be by themselves or they can commune with others. Groups coming get so much closer by the end of the week or 10 days. Um, but they also are able to open up and speak to other people. Um, so we have times of reflection. We sit and we eat and just um, commune with each other. And it's relaxing and profound throughout the whole time. Um, this is one of our greatest highlights that Luke remembers. It's one of his favorite moments that we went to a pilgrim's refuge along the way. Um, and it was about 30 or 40 people in the refuge and we just invited all of them for dinner. It's like, we're gonna have dinner, all of us together. And so they all had dinner with us and we stayed in a circle and we stayed for probably an hour or two just talking and they joined us for reflection and asked questions in different languages and we had to translate and it was confusing, but it was confusing and amazing. Um, and so this is, I just wanna repeat this every time I go. So just to explain a little bit about the Camino, um, people walk along and follow arrows that look, can look like this or they can just be spray painted yellow arrows on walls and the idea is that you should be able to just walk along the arrows without a map or anything and just trust in, we trust in God, but a lot of people trust the arrows. Um, and then you have the final destination which is the Cathedral of St. James in Santiago, Spain. Um, I like this picture because it shows a little bit of analogy with life. Um, we try to focus a lot of that as we walk the St. James Way of how we continue, can continue it throughout our lives. And one of the things we focus on is what guides our life? Who are we following? What arrows are we seeing throughout our lives? Are we listening to God and which ways he points us? And then to think about the destination of what God has in store for us. Um, are we walking every day, hoping for that, working for that? Are we remembering that? Um, but also to remember that it is the, the, as we travel, that is our life experience and it's those we touch that are important. And so we like to reflect on those things of how the St. James Way can really be a reflection of life. Um, this is kind of a quick transition between things. I'll have questions afterwards. Um, but at the same time as we have the St. James Way, I'm also studying um, psychology. I'm getting my master's this year. And this for me is another great outlet for ministry, just working with the college students. Um, after my first year of college, it was a little difficult for me because it is a big transition. Um, and so I joined the mentors program that there is there. Um, and so every year I get to be a mentor for how many students want me. <laughs> Um, and it's really been an enjoyable experience to get closer to younger students that have had easier or harder times than I have. And just to be able to grow closer to them and speak to them and tell them what has made me have strength through these difficult times. And so that's my school and classmates. <laughs> um, I just wanted this picture because I wanted to reflect a little bit on 
why am I so passionate about Portugal and why should you be as passionate as me? Um, this picture is not exactly a pleasant picture. I mean, I like the Portuguese flag and the people, but it's actually um, not, it's a protest, it's not a riot because Portuguese people aren't that active. <laughs> um, but Portugal is going through a very difficult time and has for several years. Um, they're going through a huge economic crisis. People are, I'm really depressing, but, but people are really going through hard times um, economically, emotionally. Uh, apparently, there are studies showing that three in every, um, one in every three Portuguese people are being medicated for depression or anxiety. So that's a third of the population is being medicated. So who knows how much the rest are. Um, but it is a country that has passion anyways, and they fight for what they believe in. And I have lived and grown up with them and have really grown to love Portugal and the people in it and the culture. And just having grown and seeing that, I want to see God's love spread throughout the country and see people growing closer to him. Um, seeing this need and the difficulties that are there, I can tell that they could be helped so much by following Christ and that that could fill the void that they feel in their lives. And so it's kind of a sad but a hopeful picture. Okay, so um, at the end of this, I wanted to just share a verse that for me, becoming a sower with Encompass, which is basically a missionary, has really been important to me. I read it and it's like, this speaks to me. <laughs> um, and so I'll just read it out loud. Um, it's Hebrews 5, 1 to 9. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. In the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, you are my son, today I have become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, I guess. Uh, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Um, I like this because it shows that we're all called, we're all selected by God and appointed by him, and everything that we have experienced in life is what will help us in our task. Uh, we will learn from our suffering and learn from the fact that we know we are weak, to be gentle for others, to pray fervently, to cry to God and ask for those around us, to have them be helped the way he has helped us. And even though we have not learned submission uh, and perfection, uh, we know that he is working us through that. And so every difficult time and every moment that we realize I'm not able to do that at all, um, God is working through us. And this has been special for me as I've started my work as a missionary, and I've just gone back to it several times just to remember that I am selected, and I'm just hoping that you'll feel the same way that you are selected. Um, even if you're not having a direct influence in the work in Portugal, you are selected to pray, to cry out to God for the people in Portugal, and I hope, hope that just having talked a little bit about it, you'll be able to cry out in a more effective way, I guess. Um, yeah, and so that's basically all that I have, but I'm open to questions if I wasn't clear. Yeah, um, sorry if I wasn't clear about that. I, um, when I wanted to start working for Encompass, I asked if there was any sort of position that I could have that would be a little bit short term. And they said that the only thing that they could think of was a sower, which is um, short for um, short, no it's not, 
I'm sorry, I know this by heart, but I'm getting a blanket. Serving overseas workers, that's right. Um, and so the idea is that they'll, they, they usually do it for the chateau in France, if you know that, that they'll have a couple or two friends go over and just help the missionaries that are working there, usually with more practical things. Um, and so they said that I could do that as um, just to help the missionaries that are in Porto, though technically there aren't any <laughs> right now. There are um, CARES associates, which are nationals that are helping there. And I thought that sounded amazing because that is exactly what I, what I want to do. I just want to help in whatever way that I can. Um, and so it's not exactly the same in the sense of I'm not doing just practical things, but I am helping in what, whichever way that I can, whether it be on ministry. Um, one of my main tasks is just communicating with the outside, um, with churches in the States like you um, and other countries in Europe. Um, since I do know the English language better than most of the people on my team, it is easier for me. Um, and so I've been appointed a little bit of a communicator to the outside world. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, we have a, a main Portuguese church in Porto that I'm a part of as well. Um, and we also have an international church that was started by my parents. My mom still goes to it now. Um, but they are pretty much um, independent, not independent in a bad way, but they can, they're self sufficient. So we don't have to work as hard in that area. Um, but Sam and Tracy Schwartz in Lisbon as well, they're working and they have. Um, a ministry that is focused on serving the city, it's called Serve the City, um, where they work with homeless and just helping the city become a better place, but also teaching them. Um, and they also have a church base there. Um, there's a lot of ministry, I wouldn't say connected with the Grace Brethren, but there's a lot of ministry going on in, in Portugal. It is not a completely, it's not a country that does not know God in a complete way but it is a country that has seen God and has walked away from it. And that has really been one of the difficulties. It seems like it would be better even if they didn't know, know him um, because it is a country that has suffered mostly with the Catholic Church that is not trusting of God. And one of the things that we want to bring back to them is to renew their view of God. He is not a God that is distant and far away and can only be reached if you're listening to Latin and don't even understand what they're saying in church, um, or you eat the little crackers that they put in your mouth. Um, it's a God that speaks to you directly and is with you every day of your life. Um, and that is something that sometimes is astounding to them. They'll say that they're Christians and they're Catholic, but they've never even prayed. They've said, they've recited certain prayers, but they have never asked God something specifically. And so it is almost a new religion to them, and that is something that's pretty exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Questions. I was going to have Eric come and share a little bit because he's going to tell about the plans for the trip coming mm -hmm. up next year. So we have this one. <laughs> yeah, as uh, as Susanna actually kind of mentioned a little bit, um, we're actually planning on taking a trip uh, next summer uh, to do the Camino. Um, actually, Luke, give a wave, Luke. There he is. Um, is kind of heading that up with Grace Church in Bath. Um, and they're going to be taking a team, but there's an opportunity that's been extended to our church uh, for anyone who wants to go. Um, to uh, kind of work. I wanted to read something. Actually, uh, I have to give credit to Luke. I try not to unless I absolutely have to give credit to Luke. Um, we're brotherly in our love. so. <laughs> but uh, he, he wrote a little email, and, and I thought it communicated the best way um, and better than I could because I've never experienced a trip either. Um, kind of what the Camino is, uh, and this is what he wrote. He wrote, uh, to walk the Camino is a personal journey. Our lives have become filled with business, financial, or personal success, or even just passing our lives with entertainment. Uh, to walk the St. James Way is to return to the heart of Micah 6.8. Uh, he quotes it, he has told you, O man, what is good, and what, what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God, or with your God. 
Um, it is a call to shed off all the distractions and snares of our everyday lives and to connect with the heart of God on a deeper level. To actually hear the still small voice of a world of co- in a world of constant noise and to connect with your fellow man in a very meaningful way. To be a true pilgrim is to lay down our spiritual and emotional burdens for a short period of time and carry a physical one. The trip is two weeks um, in August of tw- 2015. Tentatively, the dates are August 1st through August 16th. Um, it, is, it is a backpacking and, and hiking adventure uh, ending in Santiago, Spain, and we will be walking about 100 miles. Uh, Europe has walked away from the faith, uh, and we have the opportunity to bring light into a dark place. Um, so that's, that's kind of the opportunity that's been extended to, uh, to all of you. Um, I would hope that uh, some of you, some of you already have, my mom has, has gone, um, and Linda has gone. Anybody else from our church has, has gone? I don't think so. Um, uh, you guys would know Jackie Jensen, uh, now minis- uh, missionary in Cameroon, and our aunt. Um, she listed it as one of the top things that has changed her life. Um, so it, it, is a, it is a really powerful time. Um, so I would really urge you, if you guys are thinking about it at all, uh, to kind of talk to me or, B- or Bud, um, and we will uh, we'll make sure that we can do everything we can to get you guys over there. Uh, talk to my mom and Linda. I know they both had a great trip, so um, make sure you corner one of them. So that's about all I have.